solution very clearly. All I'm trying to do is that these records show that Tibet was never part of China. The end. Okay. What are the implications? It's not for me to 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 state those implications because I'm not a Tibetan. I'm not a Chinese national. Okay. What rights of me? What rights do I have in telling other people what they should do? Okay. But I'm, I'm just showing you, not even facts. I'm just showing you the records. I don't think I want to go into too much details, but as I've said, my book um, explains all these intricacies very well, and the English version will be coming out soon. So I hope you can read it yourself. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode on Duke Talk Podcast. I am Duke Targil. Talk is mainly focused on the history, culture, politics, and current affairs of uh, Tibet and China in international politics. Uh, this is a special interview, interview on the complexities of Tibet and Ch China's history with Professor Lau. Pro professor Lau was a professor at City University of Hong Kong and also the author of China versions of Tibet history. Tibet was never part of China since antiquity. Thanks, Professor Lau, Johnny, to Duke Talk Podcast. Well, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about my research issues. And uh, Mr. Doctor, uh, let's proceed. Can we start with like your introduce about your academics, your research interests on the Tibet and China, uh, China's uh, history? Well, since I was in high school, my favorite subject was Chinese history. But I didn't want to continue uh, on doing that because at that time it was difficult to make a living as a history major and being a history teacher is difficult to find a job or a, a good salary. So for my undergraduate degree I studied engineering and then for my PhD I studied business and then eventually uh, I was able to take early retirement. So after I took an early retirement more than 10 years ago, I could uh, sort of afford to go back to my childhood favorite subject and started doing Chinese history. And I was going through uh, the old records of, of China, I found that there is one topic that stood out as something that is most interesting because there was so much controversy and also to be blunt, uh, there was a lot of lies, uh, fabrications and outright forgeries and so I I was trying to just look for the correct uh, versions of the truth, so to speak, and that's how I became more and more involved in the, uh, the historical relationship between Tibet and China. About your book's title, The Genuine Versions of <coughs> Tibet History. <coughs> so wh why you keep like this kind of title? Like both of the, the Tibetan side and Chinese side, they are fighting for the history, right? Like the genuine version. And you are talking about the genuine versions of Tibetan history. How you come with this kind of topic? Okay. Um, in every issue, of course, there are at least two sides to the story. And very often you have one side and I have the other side and disagree, okay? And how do we tell who is telling the truth? Well, the reason why I have chosen the Tibet-China history as my main sort of research is because it's a very unique situation where if you look at Chinese genuine authoritative official historical records, it actually proves that the current Chinese government's version is wrong and the Tibetan's version is less wrong, which is very, very sort of unique because usually you would expect that if you look into the Chinese records, the Chinese records will prove that the Chinese side is correct, right? It turns out to be just the opposite. And so that's the reason why I want to do that. And my, my book was originally written in Chinese because I wanted to use Chinese records to convince the Chinese that, well, uh, look at your own record. Your own record says that uh, you have invaded uh, Tibet uh, in a very unethical and immoral way. Yes. Uh, when you started this research and how many years it took for your research, all of them? Well, I started doing this shortly before I took early retirement. So it has taken me actually nearly 10 years to write my first volume of my book. I'm working on a second volume, but the first volume took me nearly 10 years. 
I have to read a lot of um, uh, old records and to actually make sure that I'm not saying the right thing because um, I'm in a very awkward situation where I'm actually accusing a very sort of a powerful and strong country, the People's Republic of China, uh, stating that they are fabricating and uh, uh, forging historical data. And I had to be very, very sure that I'm not making a mistake. So it took uh, a very time-consuming research. I had to look through many records to make sure that uh, I'm not saying the right thing. I'm not saying the wrong thing. On your talk at the University of Westminster and testimony at the US Congress, uh, both of them you are mentioning about the, the, the source. Like for the research, the sources are very important, mm -hmm. and the primary source and semi-primary sources. Mm -hmm. So for it took like 10 years. What are the sources that you are looking for like last 10 years? And I, I am, I'm taking a very chauvinistic approach in this. I only consider Chinese records. I dismiss all Tibetan and Western records. I consider them as untrustworthy. Okay? Yeah. Um, and I'm saying that the Chinese records are the ones that are trustworthy. Um, and it's actually not just being chauvinistic, uh, it's also being very objective because indeed um, China is one of the very few countries, in fact it is the only country that I know of where you have more than 3,000 years of written records okay, that are being kept in a systematic way. Uh, I'll go through it very briefly. Um, we have uh, a set of official histories what happens is that after the demise of a dynasty, the succeeding dynasty will convene a board of outstanding scholars to compile the history of the preceding, of official history of the preceding dynasty using archival records. These arch archival records the most important example of these archival records are what you call the veritable records. And the veritable records are constructed as follows. After the demise or the death of each emperor of a dynasty, the successor, which is usually the son of the, of the uh, emperor that just passed away, the son will then convene a board again of um, scholars and then using all the archival records and compile the veritable records for an em emperor. So what you have is that you have all these veritable records for each of the emperors of the dynasty and after the end of the dynasty you have the official history of the preceding dynasty uh, compiled by the foreign dynasty. And, and the Chinese culture in the olden days is that the educated people are taught to be very truthful in the historical records. So all these historical um, writers, uh, the, the, the board members, the historians for, for compiling the veritable records and for compiling the official histories, uh, they know that they are supposed to stick to the truth. And of course, we all are, have faults, we are not perfect people. And so, of course, people tell lies, particularly when you write historical records. But at least um, it is not the same as today, where Chinese historians are taught that the most important thing is uh, the interest of the party, the interest of the people, the interest of the government, and you can, you can uh, fabricate any historical accounts you like, okay, to suit the needs of the country, or to suit the needs of the rulers, okay, or to suit the needs of the party. So, because of this tradition, the Chinese records are not perfect, but they are much less imperfect than the records, historical records of, of any other country. And certainly, I might say that it's far more superior than the records kept by, pardon me, Tibet, okay, because the Chinese history records are secular, non-religious. It, it's not restricted by the needs of religious teachings or showing the powers of supernatural uh, deities. Um, and so, and so that's from that's where I'm, I'm coming from. And the um, 
weird and laughable conclusion is that these records turn out to prove conclusively that what the PLC is telling people about Tibet is just contradicting the vast amount of records that we see in the Chinese official uh, old records. Yes, uh, in, in your book, it's also mentioned about like uh, why must Chinese insist that Tibet has been part of China since antiquity, right? And also, uh, I read one of the Chinese propaganda books, uh, which like hundred questions on Tibet. Yes, and also I that too. <laughs> yeah, and when I read like the history, like uh, I really can't find the exact thing whether Tibet is part of China, Tibet was part of China during the Tang Dynasty, Yuan Dynasty, Ming Dynasty, Qing Dynasty, or uh, PRC, uh, like uh, the Republic of China. So when PRC claimed that Tibet is part of the China, since when? What, what is the meaning of antiquity? Okay, you actually, your question has many different angles, so I have to answer them one at a time. The first one is again to go back to what I told you just now about the veritable records, about the official records and so forth. And that is, um, very unfortunately, a lot of historians, so-called historians, when they write something, they don't give their sources. And we can just tell stories and make up anything we like, okay? Uh, you call yourself a historian, you get a PhD in history, and all of a sudden you can tell whatever stories. It shouldn't be like that. And that is, it has to have some sources, okay? You say that uh, the Dalai Lama is so-and-so, okay, or the emperor was, uh, did something. Um, according to what? According to what authority? Right? Obviously, it's not because you dreamt about it. It shouldn't be, okay, that you dreamt yeah. about it. It's because... Of, so, where did you read it from? Or where did you get it from? And then, of course, relating to what I've just said just now, um, in the case of uh, Chinese history, you go back to the primary sources, which are the veritable records and which are the official history. And that is something that is very uh, sort of, uh, again, amusing, is that a lot of these Westerners, including, for example, the, uh, the, the writer of uh, something like the 100 Questions on Tibet or China, or whatever the case may be, is that uh, they didn't go to the original sources. So your nar narratives are based on it doesn't matter whether it's a Tibetan or a Chinese or a Westerner, is that it's based on personal narratives, okay? Okay, it doesn't mean that the veritable records are always correct. But when I get my information or my narrative from the veritable records, that means I'm getting it from the most reliable source. If you think it's incorrect, prove that it's incorrect. In other words, if I use the records of the ver veritable records, okay, to state a narrative, then I don't have to prove that mine is accurate. But it's up to you to then prove that my version is incorrect. In other words, you have to prove that the veritable records contains incorrect information. And of course, any book contains it, you know, incorrect information. But you have to prove it. But uh, most of these books, um, most of these authors, they are unable to read the veritable records because many of them don't even read Chinese to begin with. Uh, and many of them, even though they read Chinese, they cannot read classical Chinese. And the veritable records are all written in classical Chinese. And many people just don't bother to read them. So well, what I have done is that I have gone through the veritable records and used those records to compare with the VR PRC version, and then in my book, I just produce the two versions and show my readers side by side. This is what the veritable records say, and this is what the PRC says, and you can see that one contradicts the other. And I'm not gonna say who is right and who is wrong, but you have to decide. Okay, for example, if you want to um, find out what happened at a certain event in the Ming Dynasty, do you want to believe a record from the ver veritable records from the Ming Dynasty? Yeah. Or you want to present, or you want to believe the narrative given by the PRC without any citation, without any identification of sources? That's up to you to decide. Yeah. So the other part of the question is that why are we interested in, in, in history? Okay? Because 
currently uh, China owns Tibet. So that's it. Why should we not talk about historical yeah. issues? Well, the reason is that is that China uh, is a signatory country of the 1918 League of Nations Charter and then also the 1945 uh, United Nations Charter. And as a signatory country, you promise not to invade other people's countries or to acquire new territories through military conquest. Now, before that, it was okay. Okay, people like Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, or even the the Tibetan uh, king, Sungzhan Kanpu, okay? Yes. Okay, these were all invaders, okay? Then it was considered at that time as glorious to conquer lands for your own country. Yeah. It's like, you can say that, you know, 300 years ago, my grand-grand-grand-grandfather owned a lot of slaves and I, he had lots of concubines, that's fine. But you cannot tell people that your father owned a lot of slaves and had a lot of concubines because no, not, not now, not yeah. recently, but 300 years ago, it's okay. So it's the same thing. So China had to claim that Tibet was already part of China a long time ago and therefore, the 1950 invasion of Tibet was not an invasion. It was a quote-unquote unification of a territory that has long belonged to China. But then once you prove that Tibet was not part of China, then that would mean that the 1950 invasion becomes a military conquest. And China being a permanent member of the Security Council, they cannot sort of uh, let people know that they have actually invaded or conquered a country. Yeah. So that is the answer to the actual second part of your earlier question. The, word was the, question. the third part again, you have to remind me. Yeah. When is the exit time they are claiming? Like okay. The official statement actually goes like that. Tibet has always been part of China since antiquity. Yeah. And then the question then becomes, what do you mean by antiquity? How long was, ago was antiquity? And um, originally, the PLC tells people that antiquity means the Tang Dynasty, which is right somewhere between 600 AD to 960 AD, okay, roughly. Um, eventually, even they themselves realized that it was a ridiculous, untenable claim. So they have revised it to Yuan Dynasty. So now the most official position of the People's Republic of China is that Tibet became part of China since the beginning of Yuan Dynasty. Actually, the technicality over here is that the, um, the, um, the PLC claims that the Yuan di uh, Tibet became part of the Yuan em Empire before the start of the Yuan Dynasty, and so it was about 1250. 1215. Okay, which is actually, as I said, it was before the official beginning of the Yuan Dynasty. Uh, because the official beginning of the Yuan Dynasty of the Yuan Empire was 1279. And then there's a long story behind that, yeah. which I don't think we have the time to go into. Any of the scholars, they claim that like, the Yuan Dynasty has lots of influence from the Mongol Den Mo Mongolia, right? Okay, this is again another complicated issue that we cannot afford to go into today, okay? The Chinese, of course, claim that the Yuan Empire was a Chinese empire, okay? The, uh, the distractors, okay, the Tibetans and then the Westerners, okay, they claim that the Yuan dynasty is not a Chinese dynasty, it's a Mongol dynasty, okay? Then we get into this issue, yeah. okay? <clears throat> okay, my research actually gets around this issue because this is an issue that I personally believe that the China's position is more correct. Because again, it comes back to the concept of what constitutes China. And the Chinese, including people like me, okay, we believe that it's reasonable to follow what's called official history. What the Chinese official history recognizes as China is China. And then, and then the official histories, okay, the traditional history, which is called the 25 histories, the 25 dynasties. The Yuan dynasty is one of those. It was at that time, 
and in fact the uh, the Yuan emperors, the Mongol emperors, they themselves openly declared that they are a succession of the tradition of Chinese culture and Chinese governments. Okay? So but we can actually avoid this whole issue because my research proves that Tibet wasn't part of the Yuan Empire, regardless of whether the Yuan Empire was a Chinese Empire or not. So it becomes irrelevant whether Yuan was a Chinese Empire. Even though, even if it was, like the Chinese claim, which I agree, um, so what? Because Tibet wasn't part of the Yuan Empire. Which, I, again, I think is unfortunate because a lot of Western scholars, and even including Tibetan scholars, they were not aware of the fact that the Yuan dynasty official records clearly show that Tibet wasn't part of the empire. They were not aware of that. Now, out to Yuan, we, we are exactly at uh, Ming and Qin dynasty, right? So my question was, like, what is the relationship between the like, Yuan dynasty, the Ming dynasty, Qin dynasty, and Tibet at that time? They were just... Okay. During the Ming Dynasty, um, Tibet was very fractured. There were all kinds of polities, principalities, self-governing. But none of these principalities, none of these independent polities were under the rule of the Ming Empire. In the Qing Dynasty, Tibet became actually sort of more unified under the Lhasa regime, okay, under the Dalai Lama. Um, but then again, that entity was totally independent of the Qing Empire. Qing Empire had no power to rule uh, or govern uh, what is today's the Tibet Autonomous Region. The Tibet Autonomous Region, of course, was established after the invasion of 1950 by the PRC. But the, the, the territory of the uh, Tibet autonomous, autonomous region was about the same as the region governed by the Lhasa uh, regime during the Qing Dynasty. Yeah, under the Gandhian Potan, right? Yeah. The <coughs> PRC claims that due to the titles and all these things, right, uh, like priest patron relationship and all yeah. these things, are they, they are considering these things are the the source because Tibet is part of China. Yeah. How can you uh, like give the reaction as a researcher? Okay. Suppose um, I ask you, or you ask me, you wonder what my nationality is, okay? Yeah. Then suppose you want to find out. What's the easiest way to find out? You ask me, Yes. what's my nationality? And if I say I'm an American, then I'm an American, okay? If I say, no, I'm not an American, then I'm not an American. Yeah, that's true. Now, one step further. Suppose if you have, result, you, you, suppose if you have reason to doubt my honesty, then I say, that, well, simply because I'm an American doesn't mean that I'm telling you the truth. Then you need proof, right? Yeah, What's the true. easiest proof? I produce my passport. You know, if I have an American passport, there's conclusive proof. On the other hand, if I give you an American college diploma or the photograph that I have with President Clinton or whatever, okay, yeah. they don't count. In fact, the moment I start showing you my photograph with American President Lincoln uh, or Clinton or, or Trump or whatever, okay, then you know that I'm a con man because you're not supposed to try to prove your citizenship by showing a photo with the American president. Yeah, that's right? true. <coughs> Same thing. When we want to decide whether Tibet was part of the Ming Empire during a certain year, okay, like uh, 1579. During 1579, was um, Tibet part of China? The best way is to find out whether they have claimed it themselves, okay? Did the Ming government or the Qing government or the Yuan government in the official documents did they claim that Tibet was part of China, like in my case. Do I claim that I'm an American? Okay. The second step is that if you want to have more proofs, just like when I say if I tell you I'm an American but you don't believe me, you want me to show proof, then what are the proofs of sovereignty? Okay. What kind of criteria do you use in judging 
But uh, at that time, Tibet was indeed part of the Ming Empire. Given that the Ming Empire claimed, assuming yeah. that the Ming Empire <coughs> claimed that Tibet was part of China, then you look at some common sense criteria. Were they able to collect, impose a collect tax? Were they able to uh, conduct census, role, tax rolls, okay, population rolls? Were they able to conscript soldiers? Were they able to administer the laws? Were they able to send judges? Were they able to uh, impose their currency, their language? Okay, um, did they? How did they conquer? Well, presumably, if Tibet was part of the, the Ming Empire, that would mean that sometime Ming soldiers or military forces went to Tibet and conquered them, right? Because you don't expect people to say, okay, I, I, I want to be ruled by you. Yeah, that, that's highly unlikely, right? So you look at all these criteria and then you decide. And most things are not black and white, they're gray. It's like, it, is, it, is it either, either dark gray or is it, is, it, is it near white, okay? I don't think I want to go into too much details, but as I've said, my book, um, explains all these intricacies very well and the English version will be coming out soon so I hope you can read it yourself What is the reaction from the Chinese readers when you like publish in Chinese version? No reaction whatsoever Even the PRC? Yes, we actually um, the publisher of a Chinese version is the um, Dalai Lama's representative office in Taiwan and after they publish a book, they also have the PDF version, and they have mailed the PDF version to a large number of university professors and research scholars inside mainland China. It was, of course, as you know, my book can be downloaded for free from the website. So that PDF file was also sent to all these scholars. So uh, there was no reaction whatsoever. And I would like to believe, immodestly, that the reason is because given the, the records that I've shown to them, the best thing that they could do is just to be quiet. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> because, for example, the maps that I've shown in my presentation is very clear. And these are the governmental maps, maps published by the central government of the Ming Empire, the Qing Empire. Uh, I, honestly, if now they pay me a billion dollars and hire me as their advisor, I would advise them the only thing to do is to keep quiet. I don't know how to refute those claims. That's true. <clears throat> Can you talk more about uh, your current project, the Volume 2? What is it all about? Well, uh, my Volume 1 has already 800 plus pages, and it's only for Ming and Qing Dynasty. So I'm trying to finish the part of Yuan Dynasty, which is really, as I said, okay, I'm trying to prove that um, regardless of whether the Yuan Empire was a Chinese empire, Tibet wasn't part of um, the Yen Empire. And, and this period is particularly interesting. Um, the proofs that Tibet was part of the Yen Empire comes from Tibetan texts. There is no Mongolian documents, there's no Han Chinese documents of the Yen period indicating that Tibet was part of China, or part of the Yuan Empire. So even the PLC propaganda, all the so-called documentation, the proofs of sovereignty over Tibet during the Yuan Empire was to use Tibetan texts. So we are again in a very amusing situation. It's yeah. very much like, it's very much like my documents doesn't show that you owe me money, but your documents indicate that you owe me money. So, did, are you, did, do you owe me money or not? <laughs> okay. Well, okay. And in this case, I have to be very blunt. 
Chinese record. That's the reason why I start out with my presentation and trying to be uh, pretend to be chauvinistic. Chinese records are a lot more reliable than Tibetan records. So I'm able to show that these Tibetan records that, that indicate that Tibet was part of, um, of, um, of the Yuan Empire, they're just unreliable. And you know why they're reliable? Because they don't have a systemic way of keeping historical records. These are historical books. It's just like, you know, you write stories. Yes. Okay, you become historical stories. After a hundred years, okay, there's some, pun me for being blunt, there's some, some lama, okay, uh, they, just, they just write down, you know, that, oh, okay, this, this, this monk was brought over by the, by the Mongol prince, okay, and this. You know, you probably know about these stories, yeah. you know? Yes. Yeah, okay. Especially yeah. the Sakya period, right? Yeah, the Pasba, you know this guy Pasba. Uh, Pakwa and yeah, uh, yeah. He was he was literally bought over by the Mongolian prince. They, he received a lot of presents uh, from the Mongolian government, okay? And then he sent letters to all the other uh, principalities in Tibet asking them to surrender and submit themselves to you know about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what kind of a stupid story is this? First of all, if this were true, that means Papa is, was a traitor to the Tibetans, okay? How can he be respected? Yeah, that's true. But also, the other thing is that, do you think the other rulers are so dumb? They know that Papa, according to a story, they know that, they, they, they know that Patswa received a lot of gifts to the Mongols. In turn, they then won their the, 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 the fellow Tibetan rulers to then submit gifts or tributes or, or money or tax to the to the to the Mongols. Um, you think they are so stupid that they would do it? Yeah. I mean, use your common sense, right? No, but there's actually more to it than that. Is that those books? If you look at the content, those are not history books. Those are religious books. For example, one of the most uh, authoritative authoritative in quotes, okay? The, one of the most authoritative Tibetan books uh, stating that Tibet became part of Mongolia has this story about how uh, the Tibetan king Sung Zhang Kanbu and the two wives, okay, from Nepal and from China, how they died. And the, the, the way it, they, they died is that one day the three of them entered the temple. I don't know whether you've read those books. Yeah. The story. They entered the temple and then three of them, Sung Tan Kampu, and then the, the Chinese wife, the Tang Dynasty wife, and then the, it's part of the, so called, the historical narratives of this book. Uh, and then the Pali's wife, they entered the body of a certain deity. Okay, I don't remember the name of these deities because I'm not a Buddhist. Uh, and then they enter, and then the Tibetan concubines, okay, started weeping and said, no, you cannot leave us like that. And so, um, and so the Tibetan wife, and I'm sorry, the, Nepalan, the Nepalese wife and then the Chinese wife stuck their head out of the two nipples of the breast. And then the Sung Tan Kapu stuck his head out from the breast of the, of the deity statue and then told the, um, the Tibetan concubines, don't worry, we'll take care of the matter, okay? And then... <laughs> You think about it, what kind of a story is this? What kind of historical record is this? It's just totally ridiculous, okay? Yeah, that's true. Okay? Um, so those are the type of Tibetan historical records that we have, that the PLC has in telling people that that kind of book also contains records stating that Tibet was part of the Yen Empire. But there are actually no serious historical books written by Tibetans recording that Tibet became part of the Yuan Empire. To say a few words for the conclusion? No, I have no conclusion because I've already stated my conclusion very clearly. All I'm trying to do is that these records show that Tibet was never part of China. The end, okay? What are the implications? It's not for me to, to, to state those implications because I'm not a Tibetan. I'm not a Chinese national. What rights have me? What rights do I have 
in telling other people what they should do. Okay? But I'm, I'm just showing you, not even facts, I'm just showing you the records. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Lau, for a really significant uh, part of Tibet and Chinese history. And thank you so much, Jenny, to do talks. Thank well, you. Well, thank you very much. It was my pleasure and my honor.